Chief and I are really big fake Jack, and <coughs> it is what it is, right? Okay. Um, he is a Bell in Malinois. He is from Holland. He just turned seven this summer. Um, so we still got probably about three years to go. That's a question I always get from people. How long do, how long do these guys work? The simple, the simple term for, for all these working dogs is depends, right? Depends on their health, depends on genetics, all that kind of stuff. A uh, good example I, I can give people now is Bolingbrook just recently retired one of their two uh, Malinois this year. Leon was just, just over his 12th birthday. Okay? And the only reason Leon retired is because he started to develop a brain tumor. And he was starting to get seizures, so it was one of those things where it was time. Right? But the day before they retired him, well, actually the day they retired him, it just happened that they were doing a search warrant, so we did a search warrant with their SWAT team the day he retired. Just like, same way you would have done it five years prior. So these, these guys are incredible, incredible animals. Um, you'll see me around town. I drive a big Tahoe. John drives a big Tahoe in Romanville. If any of you ever uh, go out to Romanville, if you live in Romanville, we work a lot together doing things in tandem. One, because John did a lot of the stuff for me when I was getting the program together. He was kind of my big brother. And for one reason, my dog, his dog is really the only other working dog that my dog will tolerate. Okay? Because the one thing you'll see with all these working dogs, especially on the police side, is they're very alpha male. Okay? They're type A personality, alpha males. When they, they want to be the center of attention, they want to be the one doing everything. They don't want to see another dog do any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's pretty crazy when we do put them in groups. We'll do obedience, you know, when you walk them around, all that kind of stuff in turns, and, and you'll see all of them, they just hate it. They hate it. Right? It's like trying to get a little kid to eat broccoli and their vegetables. It's, they just hate it. Um, but Spike's kind of our elder statesman now. Spike turned nine. So, of the training group that we have, I believe now we have 16. 15 or 16 dogs in our training group that we train with on the first and the third Wednesday of every month. So actually tomorrow morning we've got training with all of our dogs. So we all come together, usually out in the Joliet area just because we train with Joliet and they've got a plethora of places for us to go. Um, we do all kinds of stuff. Um, both of our dogs are dual purpose narcotics dogs. So what does that mean? That means that yes, they search out drugs, okay? Um, the four major kinds, marijuana, meth, cocaine, and heroin. And you can throw ecstasy in there as a fifth because ecstasy is chemically comparable to methamphetamine. So to the dog's nose, it's the same, okay? Um, one of the things I tell people, well, uh, just back up. The other part of the dual purpose is they are, you wanna call them attack dogs, okay? If I'm getting in trouble, okay, if I'm on a stop, I'm getting in trouble, if John's on a stop, he's getting in trouble. We're fighting with somebody, right? We both have pagers on our vests that we wear that are connected to a computer in our cars. That the rear passenger door is on a hydraulic arm and it's got its own antenna. So when we hit that, that door pops open, dog pops out. They come to us, they wait for a command, we give them that attack command. Bad day, right? Really bad day for whoever they're going after. Um, one of the questions with that that people give me is, well, how do they know? Well, the simple answer is the person fighting with that, right? But let's say it's not me. Let's say it's the chief. <laughs> let's say the chief's out with us and he's, he's rolling around getting into a fight. It happens. He scrapped. He scrapped the canal days this year, okay? Um, how, is it, how do they differentiate? Well, what you have to understand is they don't just come out like a rabid animal, right? Just wait to bite anything that moves, right? They're specifically trained to get a command from us. And basically what we do is it's like the same thing with a gun, okay? You get a sight picture, you point that gun at what you're gonna shoot at, right? Well, when these guys get excited, their ears go up like the back sight of a gun, right? And you just point them at them, give them that command right in their ear, or stare right at them, and let's face it, the person that's doing bad stuff, what do they usually do? They're running, screaming, all that kind of stuff. So it makes it easy for them. The other thing with my guys is what I like to tell all the guys that I work with is I think, you know, I have nothing to prove this. This is just 
Officer Ganger's own theory, okay? I think he's gotten, my guy has gotten used to it, and I'm sure Spike is the same way, gotten used to the stench of our bulletproof vests, okay? There's one thing you learn in law enforcement is no matter what you do, these vests stink. There's nothing you can do, okay? And I, when I first got them, we would do what I would, what I would do religiously is if we got like a, let's say Butler School, we got an alarm, okay? And the door was open somehow, someone left the door open and they tripped an alarm. We wouldn't just do what we would normally do, we would take an extra half an hour, get everybody together, and search that school like we were looking for an active shooter, okay? We would use sicko, and I would show guys that they could be down, down a completely opposite hallway of where we're searching, okay? Send him in, he'll go right there, he'll take a look at you, what's up? Keep going, why? Because he's doing what dad told him to do, right? He's searching for that scent that dad's of a person. But I think that scent of us being stinky vests, right? Because here's what you gotta understand. With these dogs, their nose is 150,000 times more sensitive than us, okay? So to put that into perspective, here's what I tell when I do like demos for kindergarten classes and stuff, here's what I tell them. So you guys come home on a Friday night, you're all excited, it's the weekend. You come home, mom's cooking dinner, okay? Let's say mom's cooking a big pot of beef stew, right? A lot of stuff goes into beef stew, right? A lot of different ingredients. So you walk in the door, you know what beef stew smells like. Well, Sicko walks in the door, he doesn't know what beef stew smells like, but he knows what every, he can, his nose can pick out every single ingredient in that pot. All the way down to a speck of pepper, a dash of salt, everything, right? It just, that's just the way his nose works, that's the way they're trained, okay? And I could bring someone in here that can teach you all the scientific stuff about that, it's crazy, it blows my mind, and I just say, look, that's how it works, okay? But there's all kinds of scientific <laughs> stuff about how they train them and all they do all that stuff. So the other part of dual purpose is they are aggression, so they will bite on command. They're tracking dogs, right? So they track anybody for any reason. But there's all kinds of Supreme Court rulings and stuff and policies that we have to follow when we do do it, right? There has to be certain circumstances and we'll, we'll talk about that. They do article search, which is basically a term for evidence recovery, right? So here's the disgusting part of the program. Everybody knows about skin cells, right? Fingerprints, skin cells, yours are your own, right? My skin cells are not yours, right? Mine smell different than yours, right? Every single day, whether you like it or not, just by being alive, your body sloughs off around 13 to 14 grams of skin cells. It's kind of gross when you think about it, right? But when those skin cells, a lot of them are so small, when you slough them off, they just turn to a gas, right? But what these dogs are taught to smell is that odor of a skin cell, right, dropping. So what it does is it actually drops because it's heavier than the air, it drops to the ground. So they sent two things when they track. The ground disturbance of you kicking, you kicking all kinds of stuff up when you're running if you're a bad guy or if you just aimlessly <laughs> wander off into the woods and we're looking for it and you're just walking. You're kicking stuff up, but you're also dropping your skin cells behind you, right? If you just rob a bank, okay, it's even better. So now you're running, now you're sweating, that sweat's coming down, that sweat's taking even more skin cells down to the ground, right? And it gets all those pheromones in it too, so the dogs are like, oh yeah, right? That's why you see a distinct, if you ever watch on TV, like, let's use live TV, because everybody watches live TV now, right? I'd say when you're watching live TV, you see those dogs working on there. You see a dog looking for a lost child or someone of the elderly, elderly variety that just wanders off into the woods versus somebody that just committed a crime and is booking. Look at the difference in the dog. The dog will almost look kind of bored for the, for the, for the child or the elderly, but when it's a, someone doing a crime, boy, they are ready to go, right? It's like a kid on Christmas. And it makes our job easy. It's like, what am I here for? Go get it, man. There you go. Right? Um, my guy is Dutch. He came from Holland. Um, 
Most of the dogs that we train with came from the same place as me. John likes to be a little different and be the outlier and be from a separate place. <laughs> right? Uh, so what happens with, with these guys is, for whatever reason, the best bloodlines for all these dogs is overseas. Okay? They've tried breeding them here in the good old US of A, but they're just not the same. Personally, I think it's because they get away with a lot more stuff over there. I think they beat the crap out of them a lot more than we would get away with here. Okay? Because my guys have been trained to do nothing but what he's been trained to do since he was eight weeks old. Right? So he's in this big. That's all he's known. His whole life. That's it. Um, and that's all he's going to do until, until the day he dies. Um, so they import them. Companies here. Fortunately for us, our dogs come from what I call the one and one A in the working dog world. Okay, I got mine from Shallow Creek Kennels in Sharpsville, Pennsylvania. He got Spike from Bondley Kennels over in Denver, Indiana. They're they're the best. Okay, those are the two companies that supply special forces dogs. They supply all kinds of stuff, and they're they're just awesome, awesome, awesome. awesome. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, um, it's pretty cool though. At night, black dog, titanium teeth, shining. It's pretty intimidating. It's made more than a few people go. <laughs> Um, what else? As it pertains to you guys, so for your, let's call it your community, right? Let's call it the community of the elderly, okay? I apologize if that's offensive to anybody, but like I said, what, that actually, not the what, what, is, what is the main purpose of our guys for you? <coughs> Basically, we're there in case something happens where you guys just aimlessly wander around. Okay, it happens. We get old. I'm 38 years old. I am still walking around. Don't worry about it. Probably more than anybody in this room. Okay. Um, and they can find them. Okay, they will. Mm -hmm. Our guys with a patrol dog like we have. Okay. Non bloodhound. We're not getting into the bloodhound right. Okay. We have about an hour window. Okay. An hour window of, of prime. We'll call it prime scent time. Okay. That your guys' scent that you're dropping, right? The skin cells we talked about, the grounds you're picking up. Now, that's an hour in, we'll call it pristine conditions, right? We're not talking swamp, right? Middle of winter, really hot outside, really cold outside. We're talking like right now, today, what you've got outside right now would be pretty pristine to track somebody after an hour with these guys. Now, bloodhounds is a whole different story. Bloodhounds can track up to 12 hours. I've heard stories where there are bloodhounds that have tracked up to 24. Okay. So if a little child goes missing, you guys are missing in the middle of the huge woods, right? We're calling them bloodhounds. For a couple of reasons. One, their nose is specifically for that. You can't train a bloodhound on narcotics because where I said our dogs are 150,000 times more sensitive, you get into the bloodhound range, you're talking to me. So if a bloodhound were to smell narcotics, it would burn, their nose would be done because it would just burn all their olfactory, olfactory cells, they just burn up. Okay. Um, but when you do bloodhound tracks, one of our dogs always goes with the bloodhound for safety, okay? Because bloodhounds don't bite, right? They're, they're most. Hot, most. Some of them do. Sometimes you'll get a bloodhound that's, that's ornery and just get out of its way, right? They will tear you up. They're just nasty. But a lot of them are just, I like to call it like a Jerry Garcia dog, right? They're just kind of, they're just kind of there. And then our, our guys are there, especially when it's a bloodhound track for any type of armed suspect, right? Because the bloodhound's just gonna, what? Guy pops out with a knife, gone. Just gonna stare at it, right? Well, that's why you bring one of our guys about, <coughs> A little less than 10 yards behind him when we come up and we handle our business, right? And good luck. There's my guys going to get on pretty good. Right? So that's what their main purpose is for you guys. And the side purpose would be finding narcotics in your grandkids, right? If you've got if you've got bone children, find them on your bone children, right? That is. Everybody's got everybody's got life in their family, right? For instance. Santos just did a, a search warrant the other day. He got 247 grams of methamphetamine out of the house. That's a lot. That's an insane amount of methamphetamine. It's crazy. I'm still blown away. That was just, what was that last Tuesday? The other best one that we've gotten recently is we got 210 hits, so individual, individual baggies of heroin. It was a drug, it was a dealer we've been looking for, looking for, looking for. Our partner guys, Agent and I, were sitting on this guy's pad and we were like, man, we're gonna get him there, we're gonna get him We were sitting for three hours. Nothing. Three hours. Right? We got the intel that he was dealing at our, he liked, what he liked to do was go from the Circle K up at 159 in Farrell, do a bounce between the Circle K and Walgreens. Just meet up. Driving his van and people would call and just circle and meet up, right? We were looking for him, looking for him. Kept missing him, kept missing him. We got lucky one day, we were about to call it. Sitting for three hours waiting for him. All of a sudden on the radio, our undercover drug guy goes, mm. pardon my French, holy shit, he's here, right? And there he was, 210 minutes with his So you figure that saved about 20 lives. 
right? Because most hardcore heroin junkies do about 10 bags a day. Yep. Yep. There was one guy we caught in the car, which was actually a customer, okay? He had 17 bags on. Before we got here, he just shot up three. That's how quick it goes, right? That's why usually when you try to get these drug dealers with the heroin, it's always gone. You don't hang on to it long. So their customer is quick. They're agents. They're going through the sickness, right? Man, that was a good one. So that guy probably was one of the main guys dealing in the Lockport area, which I think he was, just based on some of the intel that we Still sitting his ass in jail. No one's bailing him up. I think the judge set him, I think his was kind of, yeah, the judge wasn't playing around with him, right? Um, and we sent the agency, the undercover agency took it all, but I'm pretty sure it got sent away and I'm going to test it for fentanyl too, so we'll see if it's got that nasty fentanyl. Hope not, right? Because that stuff will kill you real quick, right? Um, so I know I talk a lot. Again, occupational hazard for a head of Irishman. Uh, okay. right. um, so in a minute, what we're going to do is we've got some stuff we'll show you while we do get to get our boys, our three volunteers, right? Okay. So remember we were talking about skin cells, right? So what we're going to do, we're demonstrate a couple things for you guys today. We've got some uh, narcotics we'll put out so you can see how they find narcotics. We've got these three volunteers in front that have a cell phone, a piece of leather. Oh yeah, nice novels. Okay. <laughs> so here's something, here's something that, that is a common misconception between, between our dogs, narcotics dogs, and bomb dogs, okay? You can never have a dog that's both. It's one or the other, okay? Anyone who ever tells you they've got a dog that's both is lying. It just doesn't work. So on these brass knuckles, this is metal, okay? So our guys can find, the articles that they can find you sent on are metal, wood, leather, leather, plastic, okay? So anything, think of, think of the thousands of things in our world that are like it. So we've got a cell phone, leather swatch, right? So maybe that could be a pair of gloves that somebody used to break into a house. Could be a jacket that someone had on and they threw down, right? You name it, right? Uh, Brass knuckles, obviously, people commit crimes with brass knuckles, believe it or not, but the reason I bring up the bomb dog thing is guns, okay? When our guys, when our dogs find guns, they don't smell gunpowder, okay? What they're smelling is that human odor that's on the metal, okay? Gunpowder means nothing for our dogs, nothing, okay? It'd be the same as if they just smell a thing in carpet. Okay, so they're actually smelling that those skin cells that that person got on, got on the gun because it's, I mean, let's face it, the criminals we deal with on the street level aren't exactly masterminds, okay. That's not like what you see on TV where they've got gloves and they touch the guns with gloves. Nah, no, they don't do that because they want to be big, big men, right? Shooting sideways and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so that's what they smell. They don't smell the gunpowder, they smell you. Okay, so what our three volunteers are doing is we call that warming them up. So you just touch the articles a lot, get your skin cells on them, then we'll just kind of throw them around and you'll see how they find them. Pretty try, good. try to put them at least 10 feet apart so that you can actually see them work so that they don't find one and then find one right next to it. So just kind of, like one of them, uh, whoever has the leather or whatever, you can put it under the, uh, the edge of the ear so that way they actually have to work. In training, we try to make it harder for them in training so that it's easier for us in real life scenarios. We got to do the paperwork, all these little snip. So make it easier for us. And then it's like this is why I brought this out. Uh, we have tools of the trade for us, so the criminals have tools of the trade for themselves to try to hide narcotics from us. You thought this was a pop can. This is actually a small safe that has narcotics inside of it. So anytime we search vehicles, we do a search warrant on a house or whatever, nothing is off limits. I'm searching everything. I've searched Tampax, Tam Tampax boxes and found cocaine and heroin inside of it. I searched a Raggedy Ann dog and found 58 grams of meth. Nothing is off limits. And I'm wondering why the dog is trying to rip this Raggedy Ann dog. I'm thinking he's playing with it. And then I inspect it and find the meth inside of it. So nothing is off limits, but we're going to sit this over here too and let them 
uh, sniff this and you'll see how they react when they find narcotics regardless of uh, actually finding an article. It's a different command for everything. All of our dog's commands are in a different language. Um, I believe Santos is in Dutch also. Shice is in Dutch as well. We do that in a different language so that if I sound like Officer Gander and I tell him to stop, they'll do it. But that's in English. But how many people do you know that know Dutch? I'm probably the only black guy that knows big words in Dutch. So, he sounds like me. It's all about voice inflection. Plus, once you're with your dog for X amount of years, it's just like the kid. When you say your child's name in a certain tone, they know they're either in trouble or to come right away because you might be going out to dinner or something. The dog is the same way. When I say Spike's name or when I say something to him, he knows if I'm upset at him or if we're about to work or whatever. So it's the same thing with the commands. How you say it is not what you say, it's how you say it. If I'm going to say it, I'm going to give him the command to find narcotics while I'm talking to you, just like I'm talking to you now. He's not going to move. But when I say it, I have to say it in an excited voice if he knows I want him to work, and then he'll stop working. Um, so a couple of things we'll pass around while we go get our guys and let them, let them take a little potty time out. So what I brought to pass around, I'll give one each side. So this is Santo Sico's, we call this an agitation muscle, okay? So what this muscle is, is instead of him biting, he rams people with this, okay? In the front of this is a metal bar. It's about, I don't know, a quarter inch thick, okay? So he's like, he's like a pattern, okay? And this hurts, okay? Our guys, our breed, right, each dog's different, but around 18 to 22 miles an hour is what they can get up to. My guy can probably absolutely get that. Jump six, they can jump six foot privacy offenses. Okay, so they can play basketball for the bowls and probably make our team win. <laughs> um, so I put this on him if it's like a situation where a fight isn't legally justified, right? Because we said Supreme Court, all these court cases kind of govern what we do. Um, but one of the big things for this would be crowd control. Perfect example is we had the two. Um, Joliet basketball teams two years ago playing in the tournament in town. They requested me there, so this is on. Okay, and when he looks, when he has this on, if any of you have seen the Batman movies with Bane, it looks like Bane. It's awesome, right? <laughs> and if you think about it, it's one of those things. It's an intimidation thing. So without him even having to do an ounce of anything, someone sees this on like that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And I've actually taken muzzle blasts from dogs with these on, and damn it, it hurts. Okay. Is it hurt your head or nope. Nope. Because their their bone structure, their muscle, and you'll see, like especially with especially with Santos, okay, he's you will see the musculature on him. Like his neck is quite thick, quite muscular, and now nah, freak accidents occur like when he broke his elbow. Right? That was a freak training accident where he was running. At a dummy, right? Because when we do bike work, some neither of us have ours with us, but you have like this full suit, okay? Ever seen like those big sumo suits in the It looks like that, a little, a little smaller, but what it is is it's burlap on the outside and pad, okay? So you can feel the person inside can feel pressure, but their teeth can't get through, okay? So it's the best way we have to simulate a bad guy going into bike work going through what we call our outing sequence, which makes them spit the person out, right? Because you know, when they bite a person for real, we have <coughs> all kinds of things and stuff, like a lot of time they have to spit them out if they read news, all that kind of stuff, right? So, but this is for if that bite isn't warranted. It's like the basketball game, right? And if we're in a crowd like that, they're bite dogs. They're taught to go towards fast twitch, right? Because what is a fast twitch motion? It's usually something aggressive, right? You know, like punching and grabbing, going for a weapon, or something like that. So if we're in a crowd of kids, right, and he wouldn't have this on, some kid who's right next to him freaks out and goes like this, but they're standing right next to me. Well, a police dog, a dual purpose dog, might like that kid and not. And probably would, in a way, be justified, but wouldn't be justified. 
So we had this on that worked great. There's a half time Lockport East uh, cafeteria right there by the gym, completely full. What I like to call nuts to butts, just everywhere. Walk through with Santos, like parting the Red Awesome. As you guys can see this. And then on the other side of the room, what I'll pass around is both of our dogs. Did you get yours? Yeah. Best of yeah. So both of us got our best from the same place, except Chief, he got to do the digi camel. He didn't get to be playing black. <laughs> so this is the same for Sitco and Spike. So this is their bulletproof vest, right? They don't wear this all the time like we do, simply because it's heavy. It's like about a gallon of milk, okay? They put these on in high risk situations, so send them into a building where there's a murder suspect, a robbery suspect, something like that. Uh, I'm going to give you a good, a good story about what he had to do with Spike. But what this is, is this is actually better than any vest that any police officer wears. Why? Because it's stab resistant as well, okay? So everyone knows that Kevlar is really like really fine fishing wire, okay? That's what Kevlar is. It's just all sewn together to make really strong stuff. So in this, there's a special fiber woven in with it that stab resistant, because that's the number one killer of a police dog, is stab. And not just knives, pencils, pens, a weapon of opportunity, right? Because when you got a dog on you, and you're Joe Schmo mud, you're grabbing for something to get that dog off because it's like a vice grip with teeth. It's basically what it is, okay? So you guys can pass that around also. Um, we won't pass this around, we'll leave it up here. But what this is, is this is another one of our training tools. This is a bike sleeve instead of a bike suit, okay? So maybe what I'll do later is maybe I'll take a bike from Spike um, so you guys can see how that works. But this is the same kind of burlap and padding inside. And just instead of being full body, it's just this, okay? We put this on decoys when we do building searches and put somebody in the room and the dogs are caught, just pop the door open, here you go, get your bike, get your bike, their reward, right? That's what they're looking for, okay? Got a nice little target zone on it. If you guys want to see this while we're going to get them, just come up here, just because when they see this, they're going to get excited because they know what this is. They're not stupid. Okay. The same way if we put a bike suit up here, you can see them going like this. Yeah. Who's going to do it? Right? Okay. Any questions real quick before we grab it? If we're doing any type of situation, any situation, right, and the dogs get hurt, what do we do, okay? Well, I know John and I specifically both have, I have three medical kits in my squad for him. I'm sure you have these two. Medical kits? Like, yeah, trauma kits, medical kits. Oh, I got that, that big one that you got the So, what we have, the ability that we have in those medical kits, it's got, it runs the gambit of anything they'll run into. Okay. There's stuff to make them throw up if they accidentally ingest narcotics, right? There's quick clot agents in there in case it's a stabbing or bleed, trying to control bleeding before we get to um, the medical facility. Um, like, perfect example for me, God, I get all these stories. So the first injury he ever had was he ate fireworks on the He's fine with gunfire, right? But those big mortar boomer fireworks he hates. So on the 4th of July, it was like the perfect storm. I opened the door to the PD, the back door to the PD, the metal door, so at the bottom corner is metal, right? As soon as I opened that door, the neighbor right next to the PD lights off the door. And not one of the pretty ones, just those percussion ones. As soon as it goes off, he darts just as I'm opening it, gets his paw stuck under the door. Okay. So in the weapon of his door, I mean, sliced him right. Up. I think that was six stitches. I mean, it was a bad weapon. He was bleeding like a pig, right? Like bleeding everywhere. So I just picked him up, went in the back, had one of the guys kind of stay with him to calm down a little bit. Got his bandages up, got some like quick clot on just to get him. And at that point, the 24-hour vet to take them to 
while I was in Plainfield on Route 59 by the old uh, police department. Now the closest emergency vet is 255 Knocking, which is actually where the surgeon was that did his elbow surgery. They're great. Um, but yeah, you just kind of scoop them wrong. Okay. Um, but we've got those medical kits have the gamut. They've even got respirator masks. So they get into something where we need to get them oxygen so we can get oxygen from firemen. You know, those, those guys, those guys in red. You know that down. Okay. We have the good ones. Yes, ma'am. Is it special vets that you want to go to? Um, John can speak on that because the vet that he has specializes in working dogs. Um, I go to all pets here in town, Doc Naiman. He's very good. They've been, they've been great. Um, but it's kind of like a learning curve with them because he's the first working dog they've ever had. So in some situations in the beginning, he's not like your average everyday dog that comes in. There's because with, with my guy, I don't, I don't, I highly doubt Spike is just Spike so, so mellow. But what I was told in the beginning when I first got my dog from the vendor is overseas when they put them through like they do all kinds of tests and stuff, but that's overseas obviously before they can be in right? I was told under no certain terms that they had to get the shit out of me to examine, okay? Because for whatever reason, he has an inversion to lab coats. Lab coats and scrubs. So even going into the vet's office is fine. As soon as he sees somebody in you know, a lab coat or scrubs, Years, right? And for any anything we do with him at the vet, he has to be sedated. Right? And in the beginning, they didn't believe me. I'm like, okay, listen. Come on, I'll put that muzzle on him so he couldn't fight anybody. And they'd see how we would react to that. And they're like, okay, go get the drugs. <laughs> so, but I was told that in the beginning, in the same way with water. If he sees a hose, he not. So I'm sure overseas he was. They took a host. Okay. Well, Spike is uh, male tremors and syringe. When he's getting ready to get shot, he whips around and whoever he has a needle in his hand, he locks on him. Um, so I always have to bring him in and they have to give him a shot from behind so he doesn't see it. And for some, well, I know why it's a nail tremor thing. About three years ago, one of the assistants for uh, Doc Newman, who's uh, my veterinarian, uh, she nipped one and she cut him a little bit too deep. And ever since then, prior to that, he was fine. He'd sit there and let you do it. After that, anytime he sees him, he just immediately starts crying. So I have to talk to him. So. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, does it make it difficult? Yes. Is it horrible when you look out the waiting room and people? Because when I take him to the vet and we have to, and I have to hold him so they can give him a shot, he makes a noise that I've never heard before, and he'll never duplicate on the road, at home, anywhere. Except the vets office. It's crazy. So if you guys are ever there just getting shots and you hear this, hey, you know what's Trust me, it's a unique. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean we've got everything in those med kits. They're great. Um, not kind of wood. Never had to use um, any of the narcotic stuff, he's never ingested any, so that's great. Um, but we've got it. Um, he's got his own Narcan. Sure. John's got that too. Um, there's a lot of not for profits out there. The PD as well has supplied a few extras because they can take the expired ones. Because, um, but the ones I have are still good. Um, thank God I've never had to use them. I don't hope I never do. Um, there's been a couple times where it's been close. But like when I do search warrants and stuff, because believe it or not, drug dealers' houses are not clean. Okay, they're disgusting. I always. We're always taught to just walk through just to kind of see what dangers are out there, right? And a few of the times there's been open narcotics, we just tell the guys, hey, let's take that out of there. We'll call that room as a win, right? Because now it's obviously got the order in there. But it's open, I don't risk it. Just because I'll, I'll go nuts if the ingestion starts. You'll see a really, really angry redheaded energy in that area. We never did completely answer your question about the veterinarian uh, service. Um, the veterinarian that I use, she services anywhere from 65 to 70 police K-9 in Will Cook, Kendall, the Page, 
and uh, Lake County. Uh, she has her own ambulance. She can do small, she can do minor surgeries in the ambulance and so um, if, if it were an emergency situation where a spike injected is something, like I said, I have a kit that I can either put charcoal down his throat, I can put drops in his eye to make him vomit, different things of that nature. But I call her and she starts coming to me. So we figure out a spot where we can meet 355 and 55, and she'll pull right over on the shoulder and do whatever she needs to do in the back of the ambulance. Um, we have it set up at my department where uh, there's, I work goofy hours, so I work, our patrol officers work 12 hour shifts. So I work with both night platoons at any given time. So I teach several officers on the night shift how to get spiked in the car. God forbid if something were to happen to me, he's not going to let them touch me. So he knows most of them, but even still, he sees them grabbing on me or sees the fire department grabbing me, he's going to try to bite me. So I normally keep this in the, uh, in the back of my squad. And at the beginning of my shift, I have spare keys to my squad. And I give it to some, whoever is in the middle of the zone. We are kind of divided the zone. So whoever's in the middle of the zone, I usually give that person my key because I get to drive the entire town. They're assigned to an So I give them my key so that they know if something happens to me. Go get this. As soon as he sees this, he's going to lock on to this. Get it, put him in the car, and lock the door. Um, that way, the paramedics can get me or whatever. But if something happened to him, I would be in the back with him, keeping him calm, because that's how they initially, well, not initially, but how they, how they continue to further hurt themselves, because they're trying to get up with a broken leg or something like that. So I'm in the back holding him while somebody's driving my vehicle to wherever we're going. Uh, but she, like I said, she has her own ambulance and she meets us wherever we're at. And yeah, she's got a she's got a retired Plainfield fire ambulance, so it's it's good size. It's one of the big truck ones. And actually, the day that Sicko broke his elbow, she was there. So we were really <coughs> lucky. Scooped them up. She sedated them off the plane to her place to take extra and all that good stuff. And to further assist, uh, State of Illinois made a law that. Now, K-9 police K-9 is be transported by ambulance uh, as of January 1st of this year. So that's another thing too. And I was surprised that the fire department actually knew about it ahead of us. And I was doing a demo about two months ago. One of the guys came because I do a lot of demos for them too. So if we have to take fire to uh, the hospital, what vet do you want to go to? We have several vets that are close to us, but I would really want to get them to Doc Newman because. He knows his entire medical history and he knows her. I don't want him to see, like he said, to get white folk or somebody different. And I'm like, what we're trying to do is he wants to fight rather than help. So, yeah, I mean, it all depends on the time of day, right? Like right now, today, like let's say right now, something happened to him, I take him straight to all pets. And they, they take him right there. Because they have the ability, all pets has the ability to do everything except. That may be do immediate surgery. They can break when I'm out there. They can break all along. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like having another teenager, right? Just a high energy, rambunctious teenager that has one goal in life, and that's to find their toys and make that happen. Not more than that, right? Because we've got a couple female hangers in our group as well. All right, so we're gonna go grab our grab our nutsos. Give, but they do do for narcotics spontaneous alerts. 
So if I'm on a route somewhere and he does that, you just kind of knock on that person's shoulder, hey man, how you doing? Right? That's a conversation we have. But yes, that does happen. And when they get in here, watch when they're searching. When they're searching for something, the tails are going to be going like this. When they're getting close to it, the tails start going like this. It's like a little Geiger here. It's like I'm getting close to it, and they're getting excited because they know once they get excited, they get the toy. Their whole goal is to play with daddy with the toy. Not food, not water. They want to play with the toy. So watch the tail, the ears go off. And when we're searching for man, we give them the command to search to find, to some, find someone that's ran from us, rob someone, or something like that. It's a totally different setup. The hair on the back of the neck stands up. The ears are more pointed forward because it's like they're trying to guide in on that person. And when we're searching for someone, we're not looking for that person. We're looking at the dog. Because if you've worked with the dog so long, you know their characteristics when they're getting close to someone. You also, especially in a, in a residential area, you have to have them on leave because you can run across someone that doesn't have anything to do with this. And if they come around that corner and they see someone that doesn't have anything to do with it, they're going to lock on that person. So you have to know their characteristics. So when you get to that corner and that dog's ears pop up and the hair on the back of his neck stand up, you know there's something around that corner. Reel them in a little bit and give your announcement again. Hopefully, if it's an innocent person, they give up. This the bad guy, and he decides to run, too bad for him, he's been bit. So you just have to know your dog. I like on tracking what I like to refer to as their heat seeking Right? Because that's basically what they are. I'm mean, moving fast. <coughs> Especially we've both been doing this and working our dogs so long. I know John can do it with his eyes closed, and I can pretty much do it with my eyes closed all the time. Just because we know we can feel it on the line. Yes, ma'am. Well, the chief can probably answer that better. But basically what happens is you put it out, guys put in for it, the interview, and then they can, um, when we did ours, it hurts. So for our interview, for our department, we kind of acquiesced to, his name is Burke Magister, he's a Joliet police officer. Right? He's a certified master trainer, one of three in Illinois for dogs, right? So what's that guy, the dog whisperer on TV, right? Caesar Milan, right. So he's like the Caesar Milan of uh, police dogs, right? He's been working dogs for 25 plus years. So he sat in on our interview, and I would assume he had a little bit to do with it. Um, yes, she's that. But yeah, it's just, you know, you put it out there, hey, you're gonna get, there's an opening for the canine unit, he wants it, put in for it, the interview, and then you get the so, I mean, and I know there's guys in our group that are not dog people, right? So it's not like someone that, it doesn't have to be someone that's a dog person, right? It really doesn't. Because this is kind of a whole separate animal, right? And you'll see that when they come in, especially if you've never seen these guys do stuff. Okay, one more. Yes, it's state law now. Um, it's basically the right of first refusal, right? Right. Years ago, because the dogs are property of the city, it used to be up to the mayor. I I personally don't know of any uh, any town that's ever said no. Usually, you do like a little ceremony where you give the mayor a dollar and he gives you the dog. Right? But now it's state law, so it's right of first refusal. And I again, I'm sure there's someone out there that would say no, right? But I don't know of any hands that have given that opportunity of working with the dog for years and years and years and the bond that you build that they would say no. Right? It's family. Yeah. Just yep. Tom Sakin, he doesn't come to work. Now, like officer, like John said, we have both, and I've done it as well, there are officers that we train with basic commands if something were to happen to us. Well, all of us that train together, we all know each other's dog's commands. So if something happened at Romeoville, I monitor Romeoville's call, so I would know if something happened to him and I would go, right, if I was working. So I have that extra knowledge than the guys that he has on the road and vice versa. Like, he knows my dog, right? He's one of the only people that's not afraid of my dog, right? But he's been around him since the beginning. 
So the only officer on my department that spike, I would say 90% listens to, like he listens to me, is Officer Bailey. Bailey is the canine officer at Queen that I request. Uh, I worked with him when he was the canine officer. I was the one to put on the bike sleep. I was the one that hit from the dog. I was the one that hit articles and everything for him. And uh, he does that for me now. He'll lay a track for me or, you know, he knows the commands. He knows how to say them. That's why he listens to me. He knows how to say it. His voice is and sound like mine. And he listens to me. But my problem is he works day. I normally work nights. So, he wouldn't be the person to come and if God forbid something happened, to come and get Spike for me. Because I know he can get Spike in the car. 100% and get me help. Right if something were to happen to one of us, you'd probably get no less than six or seven can in the first time. Just because whoever's working, we would all come from, right? And like our, um, Romanville's dispatched through the Will County, the Laraway Communication Center. We're dispatched to West County. So Laraway has Will County plus six or seven other police agencies that they dispatch. West County dispatches 11 police agencies. Right? And most of the dogs that we train with are under those two, plus Joliet Ferris and their own, their own animal, right? So if that call came out for me on Westcom, the girls that are sitting at the consoles in Westcom and all their consoles for the radio room, they're going to be telling them, they're going to know, hey, keep going. <coughs> Don't have any pain. You need to get, get someone for same things, right? But, you know, I... I've given a, couple, a few of the firemen, but it's hard with the firemen, especially in my work, because every year they change a lot of them rotate firehouses, so it's hard to get the same guys. Um, so, every, so every now and then I call, if, if guys look like they're interested, I'll tell them, you know, hey, you should do that kind of thing. Okay? You guys want to stand up here in front so you can get a better view, or at least you know you guys in the front stay sitting. Everybody kind of line up behind them. Absolutely. Yep. So get those. Get those. Just one nice good warm up. Get all that, that nasty skin cells on there, okay? And then since the drugs are over there, why don't we keep those? This is kind of an open area, so it's it's, it's kind of hard to really hide anything. So if you just kind of keep it on there. Yeah. This side, since the drugs are over there, maybe just past the curtain where he can't see it. We don't want him to see it. We want you to see how he reacts yeah. when he's sniffing the board. So if you put it under the, 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 the table, table, make sure it's under there where you can't see it. You want him to smell it. Yes, ma'am. Sure. sure. Yeah, you can get, get a picture out of it. Yeah. They're, they're uh, attention mongrels. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we'll grab it real quick, so if you guys want to do what you got to do, we'll be right back. Give us like five minutes. It's wrong. All the time. He's very mellow, but when he gets excited and he finds something, you hear that he's finding something. Yeah, he's yawning. Him, he'll bark. He barks when he finds articles and different things of that nature. I think Santos just stares at it. That's what he used to do, but now he's decided he wants to bark. So. I'm going to take him out so that he doesn't get excited and distract him while he does it and then when he comes back in out or, or comes out, I'll come in. We'll look. Right. Can we take a quick picture? What I would suggest is turn your phones on silent because he doesn't like the shutter sound. He's a diva. So he's not wrong on this one. 
You know I have your toys, so you're going to be a jerk now, aren't you? Uh -huh. So usually what I have is I have my outer vest on and I take his toy. Yeah. And it's up so he can't see it, but he knows I have it. So he's kind of going to be a jerk. Let's do this. Let's switch over here. Let's do this. Hands up. 
of the Yeah, now I'm going to tease you. Oh, ah, ah. I'll pull your arms out, I think. Ah. <laughs> oh. Hi. How are you? How are you doing today? Oh. Los. Here. Cheater. <laughs> what is the one? Just like a kid. Hi, buddy. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. How's your day? How's your day going? Pretty good. All right, come here. All right, come here. Well, let's play, play. Hi, Chief. Hi, Chief. Hi, guys. 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 State Police just retired one of their uh, dogs, one of the, uh, I believe it was a District of Chicago. It's a female dual purpose. Sometimes you'll find them, sometimes you won't. But the majority of the female are single just because testosterone. All right? All right, hey, come on, it's quite cool. That's his, so that's his electric collar, so if I put him in a building, so I can, it's, it's a zap collar, but it's also just buzz. So if he's in a building, and I need him to come back to me if he's not hearing me, right? Because if you go like this building, there's going to be places where he couldn't hear me. But if I hit that buzz, he knows to come right to me, right? And he'll remember where I'm at, right? Like, same thing when I get out of the truck on the street. As soon as I get out, he start barking. But it's not because he's a jerk. It's because he's warning everybody else that dad's getting out from my swimming, right? And he knows exactly where I am. But if I go in the building, he knows before I'm at. Right? So if I hit that door popper, he comes to the door where he last saw him. Okay? Alright, that's that spike thing. That's that spike thing. Yes. Come on, man. As you can see, there's a, a, a distinct difference in the two dogs. I see. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Spike is a, he'll be nine next month. I do everything off lead. Um, Spike will be nine next month. Uh, he's a, a Belgian Malinois as well. Um, you see the distinct difference in color and size. Um, he's the old man in the group. Um, he's the oldest dog we have in our group right now. Uh, hopefully we'll be retired, both of us will be retiring next year. Um, but he's a very obedient dog. Uh, um, like I said, the command to find articles is felorn. Notice he didn't move. I'm sure Officer Gander used the same word. But notice he didn't move. It's like I said, it's what I say, not how I say. How I say, not what I say. So you see he has his paw. He's excited. He's ready to work because he knows once he finds something, he gets paid. Um, a lot of times, I mean, they, they, may, not, they may or may not find something. Um, but it's up to me to make it easier for him and make sure that he searched every area. Um, usually outside we use the wind to help us guide things to him. If the wind is blowing towards us, that's perfect because whatever scent is on whatever is going to blow towards us and that helps him to guide his way to it. And here there's no air so he has to actually search everything. So I'm going to give him the command to find articles. <laughs> Because he will not leave here, 
This is something I would tell the other officers to search because he's not leaving. Usually when I walk away, if there's nothing there, he walks away with me. But he keeps circling that because he's trying to figure out how to get to whatever is, is, is under there. Same thing with narcotics. The muzzle was? The muzzle was? I'm sorry? The muscle. It is something else? No, no, no. Oh, it was?
mean, I can see where it is, but I'm not going to keep making a search for it because it's not going up top. But normally the smell drops, it comes around the curve, and I don't know why he's not smelling that one over there. But as you can see, even though something was there, it was moved, it still indicated on the spot where it was. <laughs> That you know, only met them for some reason they find a lot faster. I'm surprised he didn't he didn't locate the uh, piece of metal that's over here. But I'm, I'm really surprised he didn't locate that. That and leather are two things that you can find very sad. I'm happy you find the metal pretty fast because most guns are made out of metal other than Glock. They have metal parts, but if it's a metal piece. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you destroyed a ball. Got balls? <laughs> Well, hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I like to talk a lot, but again, red-headed Irishman, I can, I can banter. Um, so, I mean, if you guys want to come up, by all means, they're both, they're both hams, they're both people, people dogs. That's kind of what's bred into them, too, so we can do stuff like this from an age group like this all the way down to kindergarten. So we do the, the whole gamut, we go into all the schools. We do, you guys have had grandkids or kids go through Lockport High School in the last five years. He does Road to Reality. I'll bring him out there so we can do some. And there it goes, there it goes. Don't swallow it. Doesn't take long. Hey, you want to go swallow it? Does your shoes. They will tear tennis balls up like a no tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, like these two, they tolerate each other because they've been around each other the yeah, most. they're not even looking at each other. Yeah. No, but they're pretty. They're pretty used to each other. Um, he doesn't. There's really only one other police dog that he tolerates, and that's a uh, Will County Forest Reserve dog, Julo. It's a big German, 95 pound German Shepherd. Again, because it's a dog, he's been around a lot. By all means, if you guys want to come say hi to him, you scratch each of their butts, you'll be their best friends forever. <laughs>